Hello and welcome to the Next Level Podcast. I'm Tim Miller with my best friend Sarah Longwell and my our aspiring good friend Juno Diaz, who's coming up next. If you don't know Juno, he's a Pulitzer Prize winning fiction writer. Uh, his books Drown, The Brief Wondrous Life of Oscar Wilde, and This Is How You Lose Her have been highly acclaimed. I think they're great. Sarah's read them uh, when she was a younger woman, thinks that they thought that they were great. Um, uh, his writing is infused with a lot of commentary on the immigrant experience and social issues. We get into that. He's got a kid's book called Island Born, uh, which I got for Toulouse, which we get into. Sarah, what'd you think? Um, so I hadn't read these books in like a decade. <laughs> like I was trying to remember when, so I had to go back and refresh, but I had lo- like, it was one of those things, you know, you do this yeah. with an author, right? You read one book and you think, well, I need to get my hands on everything this guy's written, um, which is what I did. I read all his books all at once. Um, and uh, and I, I've, I've loved his writing, but then like I hadn't revisited it. So actually the best thing about interviewing him was getting to go back and read some of that and remind myself of why I liked it so much. Um, and a lot of the reason I liked it is because it's writing like, you, you know, whenever some, you, you hit a style and you're like, I've never heard this yeah. style before. It's lyrical. He infuses Spanish with it in a way that, you know, for a, what am I, like a yeah. gringo, you can, uh, you can, you, you can, you can track, uh, you know, they're not, he's not, it's not, um, and, but anyway, so I, so I loved his writing. It was, um, but then, yeah, like he hasn't really been in my consciousness and I, I knew that he'd had this little, the, I knew that he'd had a Me Too scandal of some kind, but only in the slightest way. Um, I had, it had, the headline had, I'd scrolled past it at some point. Um, and I thought that the way that he handled that conversation when we brought it up was candid. Um, you know, you and I had done, I I know I did, I I had not been in a situation before where I was going to be like an interviewer of somebody who had this happen. And I wanted to make sure that I felt like we were treating it properly by not, not talking about it. Um, but one of the things in the research that I did was just how much he had been sort of exonerated by the process. Uh, and, and, and so the conversation was sort of ended up being more about maybe how it had impacted him to have this happen. Um, and I thought, yeah, I thought he was candid and honest. He's also a creative writing instructor at MIT. And so he's in in the heart of this discussion. Anyway, you'll you'll listen to it. I think it's an interesting nuanced discussion. I want to get to the indictment stuff, but there was another story that made me laugh when I was thinking about our conversation today. I don't know. Did you see this? Katie Hobbs is spokesperson. Have you caught this? Yeah, she she got fired. She gets fired. Her tweet was horrible. It was kind of related to what we were talking about on Wednesday about concerned about our the rhetoric online after a shooting and and she's like if you're a transphobe and then like this is what we're i don't have the exact quote but it's like this is what we're gonna do and it was a and it's a gif of like people with guns and it was a really yeah it was really really inappropriate but i was thinking about this today i was thinking about our conversation with juno and it's like there's just this balance that it's important to strike i think that he does he talks about this right and he he was on the receiving end of this is like on the right, you've got Donald Trump out there literally threatening Alvin Bragg, you know, with a baseball bat, with death and dust, death bat, and destruction. Right. He's the standard bearer. No accountability, nothing, right? And and the whole Republican Party right now is threatening. Yeah, here violence. it is. Us when we see transphobes or, and showed it, showed it, and she showed a gif with a woman touting two guns. So like, oh yeah. my god. So then on the left. So like canceled. canceled. I'm not just like canceled, but good. Like yeah. she gets fired. You shouldn't do that. As a person, you can't do that. There's accountability culture on the left. But then it gets, you know, how, where do you find that line between that holding people accountable and like this mob, you know, the, the a ruling of the mob on the other side, right? Where like the mob decides, yeah. oh, there's one accusation against somebody and now, you know, they, their their reputation is ruined before they've had a chance to, to have it hurt here out. So I just, I think that it's, it's super interesting and like the... And, and, you know, I think that there's sometimes rightful criticism of the left for overstating on this, but it's just kind of, it's, it's jarring to have that conversation amidst this, like, oh yeah, fuck it. We're going to threaten violence, you know, up and down leaders on the right, you know, uh, uh, from Trump all the way down to random bloggers, spokespeople, everyone, right, is, is, is doing this and on Fox News and absolutely no accountability at all. I'm wondering... On the indictment stuff. So we did, if you're not a member of Bulwark Plus, uh, we did a live, slightly tipsy. I'll speak for myself. I don't know. Maybe Sarah was also slightly tipsy. Well, it was, I I was, my cheeks are a little red in it, but I got to say, you know, I was at a happy hour and then everybody was like, we got to get to do a live stream. And so I just, I had to make a choice between being like, 
I've had a couple drinks, and now we're going to go talk about politics or not doing it. And you know what I chose? I chose you chose content. content. And yes. by the way, I uh, <laughs> I didn't have that choice. Uh, I I volunteer. I decided to get tipsy because I wanted to pop champagne as soon as I heard the news. So it was not a circumstantial thing for me. I chose to do tipsy content. So if you're not a Bullard Plus member and you wanted to see our raw, unfiltered thoughts, subscribe now. Go into plus.thebullock.com, and and you can go back and rewatch the video from last uh, from excuse me from Thursday night. Um, uh, but now you know you've had a little bit of time to kind of think about it a little bit more, what, read the takes, have a more sober-minded assessment. Any any updated thoughts you know from our Thursday conversation? about the indictment. So I've spent all morning on the phone with reporters who are all asking variations on the same question, which is like, how does this change the dynamic? And I would say my position on the changing of the dynamic stays is roughly what I said last night. Like the way that this helps Trump is, and and you're seeing all these takes, you just elected Donald Trump. You just nominated Donald Trump. I want to just sort of address this idea because I do think that I've always said it helps in the short term. But I think it's tough to know what short term means. Is short term the duration of the Republican primary? It is very early. Donald Trump got in very early, so this scenario would happen. So he would get indicted while he was actively running for president. And while we're talking about all these other potential nominees, everyone's focused on him. The media is focused on him. The only thing that really hurts Donald Trump is being ignored. So everything is going to play to his strengths now because everyone's going to be focused on him. But how short term is that, right? How many other indictments follow? What is the dynamic of those? Are people as willing to defend him on those? Um, You know, what is the strength of even this indictment? It's not unsealed yet. We don't know. Um, And so I just, I think that the idea that this wins him the nomination takes the analysis, the true analysis of the fact that this helps him in the short term too far, too far. Um, Then there's no way of knowing that. There are a bunch of different twists and turns to this uh, over the next... I mean, we're a year away. Like, we're not, we're slightly less than a year away from Super Tuesday, which is March 5th of 2024. So, like, there are months and months yeah. for this stuff. No to play one out. has a lower view of the right wing voters than like the center right pundit class. Like, even, yeah, yeah, even right. JVL <laughs> has a higher view of the Republican voters than the center right mm-hmm. public cl- pundit class, which is like already decided, oh, well, these people have no choice now but to support Donald Trump. It's like, I, I, are we sure? I just, I just don't know that you're sure about that. And, and I think maybe if you, right. as a opinion, as a thought leader, which I, I assume is what you fancy yourself, uh, people at Fox and National Review, et cetera, maybe if you told folks, actually, this is a bad thing for us to have a indicted maybe multiple time indicted standard bearer and and maybe we should like you know think a little more practically that maybe some people be won over by that argument i don't know maybe not maybe not but maybe you should try that rather than just conceding this to to trump I, one thing that was interesting i saw um uh, dave weigel observed this which i thought was really smart in 16 we've been through so many news cycles since 16 we've all aged so much but like um the Trump University thing was was in the middle of the news, right? Um, you know, yeah. which again, I I literally did it not my party this week where I start listing all Trump scams, and I'd forgotten Trump University, uh, you know, all of his illegal yeah, scams, sure. I and mean, he just has so many, right? But in 2015 and 16, it was pretty common. I, I know Jeb did, Ted Cruz, like for the other candidates to like weigh in and say, hey, like this guy seems this is fraudulent. Right. Like th- there could be legal yeah. ramifications here. This, you know, Ted Cruz did the whole like, oh, this would hurt the party to have someone that, you know, that has been in, I don't know if he said the word indicted, but this would someone under investigation. This would hurt our chances to win. So they made all those arguments back then. Now, they didn't work, but Trump was new on the scene. And this was just kind of, you know what I mean? That I, the, the, the preponderance of evidence has not stacked up, you know, as, as it has in the past eight years of all his other crimes. And, and, and it's just interesting that like now that isn't like even that position which was a common position in 2016 is like not allowed in in republican no spaces. one thinks criminality hurts right. him and this is where the the indictment of the voters really comes it's implicit in everything they're saying is they're saying we don't have voters who will care or be interested or be turned off by criminality That's what they're saying. What we have coming up next is an awesome conversation, not Trump indictment stuff. Take a little break from it. You know, get into get into campus culture, get into immigration politics, a little bit on police reform, about writing, how you write. If you're if you're uh, about the writing process, really great conversation with Juno Diaz. We'll be back on Wednesday for our our, uh, standard three triplet thruple next level thruple 
I thought it was Rumpel. We'll, we'll be back on. Let's not. Let's not okay. talk. All it. right. We'll be back on Thursday with, or excuse me, Triumphant. on Wednesday with JVL, uh, me and Sarah. And first, I don't know if you noticed, we have new theme music. It's from my boys in Acid Tongue. So check it out, and you'll have Juno and Sarah and me on the other side. Juno, thanks so much for doing this with us, brother. You're coming from Tokyo. We're we're in like multi time zone taping situation here. Oh, thank you. I'm really grateful. Thanks for having me. Man, it's going to be so fun. Um, you know, Sarah and I were talking earlier and thought maybe the best way to kind of start this, especially for people that don't, you know, kind of know your background as much um, as we do, having nerded out on your books. Um, I, I, you know, I, we want to start a little bit with politics before we get into the the writing part. You know, you. I, I've listened to you in other interviews. You know, kind of describe yourself as an activist, you know, as much as an author. And I'm just kind of wondering what what do you what do you what does that where did that begin? Like, how did that get birthed? Um, you know, where does that originate from? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, for me, the definition comes from uh, coming out of a family where they always told us it was kind of this conflict. They always told us my family growing up very humble, very poor. My mother was raising five kids by her own for most of the time. But she always said, man, we are so lucky. You're lucky you've got one parent. You're lucky you have a house. You should be very grateful. You should be focused on people who have less than you. And that always drove everything, this idea that, you know, we should be very grateful that we had a lot more. There were always kids in my neighborhood who needed places to crash. My mother kind of was like, the local Red Cross, whether it was my friends or my sister's friends, there was always someone staying with us and often for like weeks and even in some cases months. And I think that really embedded this idea that you could look, spend your life looking uphill at people who've got much more shit than you or spend your life looking downhill at people who have a lot less no matter what situation you are and how you could help them. And that began. And I was always an activist who was by activist, not the person who sits around and gives speeches and sends tweets, but I was always the, I was the, the, the back when there was envelopes, I was the envelope stuffer. Whatever menial job our organizations had to do, I was about it. And I did a lot of work, and this is in the old days, I'm talking about 30 years ago, a lot of work on police brutality before anyone was interested in New York City and even in the Dominican Republic, and a lot of works on immigrant rights. But again, it was, it was a lot of the kind of grunt, was there a police brutality experience that that prompted that, or or what what do you think got got you into that? Yeah, I think it's because my dad was a cop in the Dominican Republic, <laughs> so it was a, a fuck was, you, dad kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, and also the kind of low scale brutality of that kind of uh, that kind of an authoritarian dad. I had a real upfront look at what kind of that homegrown police culture looks like, and I don't know. I just thought. It wouldn't be a bad area to work in, you know. Is your dad more conservative politically? Oh, my God. My whole family's super conservative. Um, yeah. No, my family's super conservative. Again, it's a military family. Um, you know, my cousins uh, are combat veterans. Uh, my sister was married to someone in the army. My brother was ROTC for a while. It was we're very much uh, tons of guns in the house. Very conservative. You got any Trumpers in the family? You got any uh, MAGA got hats? Oh, no, we, I'm not sure they wear the MAGA hats, but uh, <laughs> definitely straight up, straight up. If I go to the family dinner, there'll be there'll be some Trumpishness. Uh, well, so Tim and I don't know a lot about the grunt work of activism. We were the send tweets people. Yeah. Um, and so I think uh, we admire the fact that you, you know, put yourself out there doing it. Um, how do you experience, uh, you know, how do you experience the politics of the Dominican Republic, Dominican Republic versus in the United States? Alas, uh, there was a time where I would say that I, I required like entirely two different operating systems. Um, one culture was highly medievalized, um, super cronyism, um, the kind of domination of like, uh, maybe 20 or 30 families, uh, you know, the, the l absolute low level of education and the easy manipulation by elites to the, you know, kind of poorly educated masses. Uh, you know, 
it's, they're becoming much more aligned. I think that there's a there's now one of the things social media has done is that it's definitely rewired all our nervous systems towards reactivity and towards kind of an impatience towards kind of the basic fundaments of or the foundations of any kind of you know democratic uh, context, which is like deliberation uh, and sort of moderation. You can't have either democracy or justice without moderation and deliberation, and neither of those things are being encouraged. So I find myself the the same sets of muscles, even totally different uh, sets of information archives for each of these contexts, but certain muscles are beginning to like kind of coalesce. So people say this about Trump, and maybe there might be a little undercurrent of racism in this observation, but uh, about Trump, but the, like that he has these characteristic traits of like a Latin American kind of Caudillo strong man, right? That is that is a little bit more similar, right? To to what you know the types of politicians that emerged in places like the D- Dominican Republic and other places in Latin America. I, I, do you did you get that? Like when you saw him coming onto the scene, and and some people say that that was like an appeal to for him. Uh, you know, he actually did better with certain you know uh, obviously the Cuban community and others than like Romney did. Um, uh, yeah. did, you, did you kind of get that sniff on him when he came out, when he was coming around the scene in 2015, 2016, or not really? Well, no, I mean, I think there's a, for me, there's a couple of things that are happening there. On one hand, kind of that sort of uh, impudent child aspect of sort of patriarchal kind of culture, right? That like that brash boy that never gets old. That, I think, is a commonality across most of our patriarchal societies, that that gets rewarded. Uh, The second thing is, as far as like, from my own specific context, the Dominican Republic, I mean, look, you got to understand, we had a dictator for 31 years, except this dictator was trained by the United States. And what I mean by trained by the United States, he came up in the United States Marine Corps. that in many ways he had been groomed um, and sort of put together. So for me, that kind of line between, you know, American authoritarianism, that kind of uh, script and the Dominican one, they're a lot more kind of entangled. But I, I do think one of the things is that the appeal to personality, the appeal to kind of charismatic irrationality over any institutional process, I think this is something that the two of them are beginning to match, right? The Trump really put his finger on that erosion, the, the slow nibbling away of institutions. And in a place like the Dominican Republic, the institutions were incredibly weak. In the United States, they're really robust for everything that's happened. But still, man, um, got to tell you, uh, they really gave us, Trump gave us a sense of that robust doesn't mean a lot uh, when you're facing a movement like that. Were you surprised to see it happen here? You know, I got to tell you, um, what shocked me was not only that, that Trump, you know, because I came up, I kind of kind of weaned myself on uh, Ronald Reagan. Like if I learned any politics, it was looking at my house and everybody being like, join the military. And then looking outside in the world and looking at Ronald Reagan, being like, Trickle down economics. But I was, even with that kind of sort of horizon, I was like stunned. And what stunned me even more was the way that the opposition quickly adopted a lot of his vernacular. I mean, it would be one thing if, you know, we were like those of us who opposed him were kind of coming at it from different tactics. But if I kind of erased the names and kind of a lot of the stuff that was happening both on the left and the right looked very similar, right? So there's kind of like, we're not going to talk to each other. This person now has said that. They're my enemy. Um, you know, the kind of things that reinforce habits that outlast the battle. If you're kind of thinking that your enemy is someone that you can never damn speak to, that because you said X, that's it, you're tainted forever. I mean, those are habits that outlast the skirmish. And those aren't good habits. Those are not good habits. 
Yeah, it's interesting. I, I listened to some of your older kind of comments uh, on politics, and um, you know, you talked about this collective action problem, right? That like we suck at that as a society, because like we're at at each other's throats. I'm just I'm paraphrasing you, and um, you know, though it had this tinge when I was listening to you of being kind of like you know, almost pro-socialist, right? Like we have this collective active pro- action problem and we need, you know, more community action. We need more community organizing. I'm listening to you now and it sounds a little bit more like you're a squishy moderate like us, you know, wanting compromise, <laughs> wanting us to work together, not hate each other. How, how do you, where where do you kind of define yourself in that spectrum? Yeah, I mean, shoot, squishy, I'll take anything. But for me, there's kind of, <laughs> you know what I mean? For me, it's sort of the same thing where I'm saying that like, look, we we need profound levels of collaboration. It's and the habits that allow for collaboration. Why do I say this? Well, gee whiz, we only got climate change. We only got like a bunch of stuff that isn't going to be faced if only one third is showing up. If we only got like 40 percent sign up, none of these problems are going to get resolved. There's a lot of stuff at stake that's coming down the pipe that's already here that really requires absolute amounts of coordination. And so for me, it's kind of the same thing. We need a lot more collective action, but collective action ain't gonna happen with bad habits that don't permit us to have a bigger umbrella, like a bigger tent. I mean, yeah. look, if, if, it deba- if, if everybody's approach to everyone else is prosecutorial, you know, oh, you're pro X, I can't mess with you, I mean, we it's it's we're not going to get anything done and we really got to get shit done. I mean, some of the squabbles that we're having, the energy that's getting wasted on stuff that 30 or 40 years from now are going to people going to look back and say, really, that was what was you were worried about when the whole world is burning down. We were, we were talking about this on our podcast uh, on our Wednesday episode about the issue of guns. I'm like, what do you say? Like, There's there's reason for people to have righteous anger. Right. Like, what do you say to be others on the left who are like? Man, fuck these guys. Like, they're letting school kids get shot up. They don't want to do anything about climate change. They elected this racist game show host. Like, why do I have to have, you know, what if they're, isn't that a natural instinct to just say, fuck these guys? Like, how how do you fight that? Like, uh, in what way, you're a man of words. How would you, you know, tell people to kind of combat that emotion? Hey, it's a natural impulse under a kind of neoliberal regime of atomization of everybody going to their own corner and not worry about anything. But my question is, it's also real convenient, a a, a great alibi not to have to do anything. I mean, my thing is, what the hell else are we doing while the world burns down? There are people that are really, really on the front lines of this. And Really? So if my only task is to find in myself a way to be tolerant, because look, we're not talking about being tolerant to every extreme, absolute wild person. Everyone's got their limits. But we all also have a range of people that we could be more tolerant of to gauge in conversation, because I'm going to tell you straight up what every single person here is born with this sort of wonderful, enlightened, radiant consciousness. You weren't all sorts of fucked up to age X. We're all sorts of messed up to age X. So what do you think about that person? What do you think about the self that you were when you were all sorts of a troglodyte? Is that person now someone you pretend that you erase? Or do we understand that that very person who had all this messed up ideas led to the person we are now? And are we not having a conversation with that young person we were who, if they were an adult, would seem entirely malignant to us? There's something really, really convenient and involves a lot of erasure for our understanding of what our current politics are. They often arise out of really messed up, uneducated, backwards thinking. And if we're living with that person still, now that I've got this carapace of enlightenment and progressiveness, but at this core, there was this other person. If I can engage with that person and live with them, I I can make some gestures, you know? And like I said, what else am I doing? You know, like, this is I love this. This is anybody who listens and this is you gotta understand. <laughs> You're touching you're Sarah's in, buttons right yeah, now. Yeah, <laughs> these are this is this is this is these are all all the good stuff that I love. And um uh, but I, I got something you just said, like, is this because like you've been through some things now and you see the world differently? Is it because you can 
because of your writing, a lot of your writing is sort of, because I've read everything you've written, uh, and I love you, but, uh, like, you seem to be reaching back for your inner child. Like, it is a lot of communicating with a person that you were. And so what you just said is a thing that is it's easy to say. I, I preach it all the time, the ability to be optimistic, to try to not allow our grievances to just, like, hold us back from being able to do anything good. But it is actually genuinely hard. I struggle with it all the time because I am so angry at the hypocrisy or whatever. But like, is is that, is, have you arrived at this because you've been through some things and now you see it that way? Or has this always been a disposition of yours to try to find the ways in which we can collaborate and work together? Like, are you naturally full of empathy for people who who don't share your view of the world? I mean, two things. To be honest, you know, all the crap that I went through this last four years, in fact, I fight against withdrawal and just being like, fuck humanity, fuck all these people, fuck all these systems. I'm going to do me. I've got my crew. People know me. I don't care about any of that other crap. For me, it's been the impulse to move, not to turn into the person who gets wounded and withdraws, which is what they really, everybody really wants from everybody, you know, withdraw, get atomized. I guess part of it was coming from a big community. If you actually come from a big community, which I mean in the sense that I was always surrounded, like, look, if I, there were photographs from my childhood, there would be like 50 kids playing baseball. We would be taking turns, inning after inning after inning. There were tons of relatives around. There were so many people just on top of each other. And we had to learn what was, what could be managed and what could not be managed. You know, like what was, you know, the Lenin terms, you know, uh, a non-antagonistic or antagonistic contradiction. Like what, what the was I the Lenin here or I'm the walrus? <laughs> yeah, the, the, the other one. The island. Okay. Yeah, what fire? Wow. Okay, just I'm just I just, I just want to make sure I know who but, I'm getting my this wisdom from. Whether it's but it's a tech. No, I mean I don't know. I, I just think look, ultimately, it, it, there's always been that part of me that's you know union person. It's like what what can we live with if we all want to survive? You know, a climate ravaged planet. You know, as a friend of mine who's in an emergency room, um, the emergency room doctor, he's Muslim from Jersey. And he's like, let me tell you, when I get people on my table, they're not checking my politics and they certainly ain't checking my race or my religion when they're on there. And in some ways, we're on the emergency room table. And the question is, is that what's up? What's up? What are we really about? And um, it is hard to fight the the reactivity that gets reinforced by our world. And the reactivity is you say one damn thing to me and all that pain and all that dehumanization that I'm carrying, it's I'm going to take it out on you. Yeah. I just, I, there's some people that are listening to this that don't uh, actually know the context of what you're talking about the last four years. So just, just to, to get that on the table, uh, you, you were accused of sexual harassment. Uh, the Pulitzer board investigated it. There's a Ben Smith to this great semaphore article the, uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, investigators were not just unable to identify to verify the allegations. Uh, they didn't identify allegations that the board considered sexual misconduct at all. Uh, like that said, that that there's been some fallout for you, and you haven't, you know, written in in the past few years. Uh, there's been some personal fallout. So I, I just wonder how did that. Like, what was your reaction to that whole experience? And did the, I, the follow up on Sarah's question, I guess, did that like change your kind of world political views or worldview or views about this, our culture at all? You know, it, the shit sucked. And <laughs> four years, dealing with that shit for four years, um, yeah. absolutely suck. You know, nothing. There's a lot of bad things in life. And we had the pandemic where all sorts of shit was happening to people's real lives. But you know, I was going through this and it wasn't great. Um, I mean, for me, the, you know, the, the shocking thing was, you know, here I am on the Pulitzer board. I spent nine years dealing with journalism and dealing with journalists. And for me, the shocking thing wasn't that I was falsely accused of stuff. For me, what was shocking was like the absolute silence from the media when suddenly it became clear that looks like the preponderance of the evidence is like this dude didn't do anything. You know, at first 
places like the Times were, you know, running up articles left and right. But as soon as it was began clear that, uh oh, shit isn't what it seemed that this dude is, you know, they like the idea of the possibility, possible guilty. They didn't seem to like the idea of credibly innocent. And that was shocking. And I think when you say about what my politics, et cetera, look, deep injuries to self and ones that are very public, you know, that kind of thing where you feel like, yeah, whatever quote unquote reputation you had gets burnt down almost to the ground. You, it's the same thing as friends of mine who have had terrible losses, like actual familial losses to become cynical, to become negative, to become angry, to have no forgiveness in your heart is the easiest thing to do. And it's the thing that's going to just eat you alive. And I think if I, when I said I spent four years dealing with this bullshit, the real thing was getting myself back to a place where I'm like, you know what? You can't let this shit eat you alive. You can't let it turn you into a, a quasi human. Because for me, that means like no compassion, super angry, looking to avenge yourself. I don't want any of that fucking crap. You know, I just want to go back to my life of nice deliberation, reading, doing my work with my students and putting nonsense like that as far behind me as possible and rebuild. You got to rebuild. Life's going to serve you up some shit nonstop. It's probably not going to be as humiliating and as disgraceful as this crap and as false and cruel, but you're going to get served. There ain't anybody who's not going to pull a bad card and you've got to figure out what you can do to yourself, what you do for yourself, how you can rebuild. Do you have a process like, a, you know, giving yourself things to, to work on, to do, to focus on? You know, I, 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 you're writing like are you, are you going back to, to writing? Obviously, you have the class at MIT. But I, I'm just uh, plenty of and what you went through, you know, was just so high profile. But everybody in their life goes through this shit, shit embarrassment, humiliation. Like how, how how are you getting back on the horse from like a process standpoint? I think, look, I think the real thing is no matter where, especially if you're an artist or if you feel like you have some kind of calling and life decides to run you over with a tractor, and especially if there's injustice involved, right? There's stuff that happens and it's just random. That's one specific kind of cruelty, right? You're like walking around, suddenly you get a little headache, you go to the doctor, bam. But when there's injustice involved, it creates a lot of situations. And I think Ultimately, you got to figure out and you got to remind yourself, well, <clears throat> look, many of us have callings. Many of us feel very passionate about things. Many of us have loves. We love certain things. And you got to go back to the thing which you love, because otherwise all this other secondary stuff's going to overwhelm. For me, listen, the only reason anyone was interested in me at all Ain't because I'm some bald Dominican kid from New Jersey. It's because I love books and that love of books created something. And so whatever it is that you, that kind of foundational love, you return to. And for me, it was just back to reading, back to like being in storytelling and certainly back to helping people, man. I mean, I'd always been involved, but, you know, nothing reduces quite your pain like helping people in far more pain, leverage what privilege you have, because there's nobody on the, in the world besides death who can eliminate all your privilege. You always got some space to help other people, help other people, help other people, you know? Yeah, I, 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 won't, I don't necessarily you know anything else. I want to think kind of just on the broader kind of this whole environment of around can, cancel culture, whatever you want to call it, speech, giving people space to, to make errors, to make amends. Uh, you're at, you know, you're at MIT, right? You're at on campus. And like, this is the center of this shit, you know, like every, everybody on the right says not not MIT isn't the center of it, but the college campuses is right. Like everybody on the right says, oh, my God, these kids these days, you know, the Gen Z kids, they're so illiberal and like they, they just want to shut down conversation and they just want to like point fingers uh, do you what what's your sense that you you're with these kids day in day out like do you do you feel that um or or do you feel like that's like a like a you know whatever fox news uh miss you know misdiagnosis of of what's happening with the younger generation 
I mean, look, I think it's super, super complicated what's going on. I mean, I think, especially with our young people, look, I think for me, it, and it's hard because no one wants to, I don't think these conversations are ever interested in context or nuance. They're just, you know, it's sort of the way prosecutors, they're looking for their whatever they can get you, lock you away with, and that's it. Um, there's, no one's interested in extenuating anything. For me, look, everything begins with, if you look at the numbers, arts education and liberal arts education has absolutely collapsed. We're not just talking about Ivy Leagues. We're talking about we're talking about public schools. We're talking about kindergarten. We can't even get like phys ed. We're certainly not getting arts education. So two of the greatest ways that we get people to tolerate contradiction, to entertain nuance, are off the table. Then you kind of create a, a kind of a Hobbesian world of scarcity where most of our students think if they make one goddamn mistake, they're doomed forever, where there's like, you know, Himalayas of debt, where they don't have any time because n nobody, unless you're at an Ivy League school, none of these schools are well funded. There's not enough classes. You're like trying to figure out how to get your classes while you have your job. Then most of our students are working. Then Look on top of that. Most of our students have their imaginaries captured, not in ways that allow them to reconstitute themselves. So after a hard day of having to work, go to classes and deal with all the regular stresses, you don't have any place to con reconstitute yourself. You get online and start scrolling, guaranteed to disrupt everything. So then we have a conversation about cancel culture. And I'm like, well, Really, do we expect, given all of this and more, for there not to be a certain amount of reactivity? Um, and the universities do a lot to encourage this crap, even as they sit around and say, oh, no, our, our students have to be more open to debate. Look, these, school, these schools, all of these schools are not accountable. They're interested in being reactive. They don't want to be accountable to their students. They don't want to say, well, why is it that we're basically an investment bank who's making all this sorts of profits, but you still are like, you know, you're still stressed to get classes. You still feel like you're never going to get a job, all of this stuff. And it's in that contradiction where I think a lot of this stuff happens. Yeah. Do, do young people learn bad habits from social media of like not, um, you know, of, of not waiting for all the facts before they jump to conclusions, so do adults. And I think we we have a, a, a lot of stuff. We'd love to put it on the kids, but I'm like, I don't know, man. Um, I think this is a societal problem, a real societal problem where folks have been really, really well-trained at not tolerating each other and sort of just jumping down each other's throats. And who the hell feels like they got time or energy or space or even training to contemplate a discussion. <laughs> There's no space for that. No one has any time. And so I, I hear all these conversations, but they always seem not to be discussing the students that I know who are just up to here with, there's no sense of peace. It's all precarity. It's all pressure. It's all tension. And man, I mean, gee whiz, it's, there's a lot going on here. But to focus on that, it has always been weird. Yes, yes, yes. We've got to have more tolerance. We've got to have reinforced the ability of people to actually hear people that they think are, or at least to allow views that they think is malignant. Both sides. You can't just claim your religion and be like, so this person can't exist. And you can't claim your politics and say this person doesn't exist. We need more of that space, but there's a lot going on. But it's, that's the whole point of the academy. It's the whole point of universities. It's like you're supposed to be there reading, being given space to challenge yourself with ideas, hear things that you disagree with, have good teachers who are sort of guiding you through, you know, life's nuances into contradictions and understanding that. I mean, isn't that the whole point? And do, are you saying that's not what's happening uh, well, on college campuses right now? What I'm saying is like, look, what colleges are we talking about? There's so many college campuses. Yeah. And if we just... So focus on the, the brush fire. We miss it. So look, if we're talking about the select colleges, the Ivy Leagues and the top select colleges, first of all, what diversity of ideas? I mean, if you subtract people with money from a place like Harvard or a place like Brown, what's left? So subtract people with money and people who have been to private school, high school. 
what's left? I mean, maybe we could encourage more of this if the if academia itself was more diverse in ways that were actually kind of <laughs> complex, you know? And I think that it's true. Like, the the look, I wouldn't want to be a poor kid at any select school, but these days, it's not like when I was there, where there was at least a couple of us who were poor kids in these select colleges. Now, the numbers have dwindled. And so, yeah, I mean, of course, Academia should be a place for this to happen, but we've squeezed, first of all, we've squeezed real diversity um, so that kids are not even encountering people that are very different from them just on their daily basis. Second of all, you know, shoot, these kids are learning from social media and other things just to be as reactive as possible. I mean, I'm not sure it's their fault that they've learned some of these bad habits. And yes, we are trying, everyone's trying to kind of, you know, encourage more of deliberation, encourage more conversation, but we've got a lot aligned against us. Do they give you a hard time about the women, the way you talk about women in your writing? I mean, I, my, my students, you mean? Yeah. Like, I guess I mean, I'm, I I, I'm imagining the horror stories of cancel culture on campus. And I guess I'm thinking like, uh, of the way it would manifest in terms of their, it's, it sounds like you're describing like an inability to engage with art uh, in a way that's critical. And so I guess uh, I'm wondering if people engage with your art in ways that are critical in these shallow ways that you're describing. I mean, I've, people have, I'm not saying my students, I mean, I think people have in general. I think, but that, again, it's one of those things where <sighs> I'm one of these people who thinks that like, look, that sort of just, kind of split, non-thinking, just I'm going to simplify who folks is. This happens. But for the most part, when I'm thinking about the students I know, um, most of them are so overworked and so fearful about getting a job and not getting a job that I'm not sure any of them are They've got even the space for this stuff. And what kind of, can you paint us a picture? I have no idea. What kid goes to MIT and then takes Juno Diaz's writing class? I like. I can't even. I can't even envision what this. Can you stereotype your your it's student? Like you need a for break us? from yeah. building like a robot yeah. or. Like, yeah. <laughs> I could. I could. Let's try another school, <laughs> not the school that I'm at. Let's try <laughs> when I was at NYU. Again, okay. these are very elite. Kind of, yeah. these kids got a lot of pressure. These kids, their parents are kind of like, yo, we're spending this loot. You better justify this with a career. <laughs> yeah. I think what ends up happening, even in places like NYU, where I was teaching undergraduates, and despite the reputation and what everybody thinks, the majority of the undergraduates that I was teaching at NYU, none of them wanted to be creative writers. But they, like most select college students, are awesome at everything. They were on a sports team. They played an instrument. Some kind of musical or some kind of thing. They did enormous amount of volunteer work and were still doing it. And they had an art that they were kind of like badass at. And so, Sounds you know, amazing. These kids sound amazing. I was, just, I was just smoking kids. weed and gambling on sports. I, what the hell was I doing? I wasn't doing anything. I didn't I do anything. Survive. I had no skills. Brother, I could not survive the college application process now <laughs> because the pressure is so intense. So I guess what I mean is that these kids are kind of awesome at everything. And, and some of them are like, they're like, yeah, no, I want to start my own engineering firm. I want to start this. But I also kind of want to write a book or two. And I believe them. <laughs> I believe them. I'm like, oh, these kids will knock it the hell out. You know, wow. and you try to help as much as you can. I want to do writing stuff, but I just, I, I have to. I have one, burn, one final burning political hot button I have to ask you about, which you seem like the perfect person to give me. A, a one minute rant about what I have no idea what your position is on the use of the term Latinx. Woof. That's a, that's a bag, yo. That's a big old bag. <laughs> right. There and, is a big old bag. That's what I'm saying. I want a nuanced, your nuanced, deep thoughts on Latinx because it talk about a shallow debate. The la, the Latinx versus not Latinx debate is about as shallow as it as exists out there. So, so where yeah. are you at on it? And it's interesting the way that everyone can have their own opinions. And yet what's fascinating is how language gets the final vote. 
this really kind of remarkable, uh, dynamic, absolutely protein, always changing and shifting, it gets the final vote. So I think at an executive level, People are using Latinx at an executive level. It's an interesting, you know, it's important. I prefer the E that comes out, the Latine, because it actually makes sense in Spanish. But what's fascinating is how little traction it's gained inside of the actual language. And I'm talking amongst even my most sort of the friends of mine who are like really into this. It's like when you're speaking Spanish and you're speaking Spanish, it's remarkable how it's not getting a lot of traction. Now, that doesn't mean it won't get traction. That doesn't foreclose the ability for language to transform. Uh, but I think it's possible for both of these things to exist at once, that you could have this executive function where you're making all sorts of important political um, openings by using the word Latinx. And then you kind of drop down into another um, realm where the exigencies of language are making that more difficult for you to do. And it's become kind of a way of, uh, talk about code switching. My friends once described it as code switching. They're like, are we speaking Latinx or are we speaking Spanish? <laughs> and that should crack me up because it was true. Once we start speaking Spanish, a lot of this stuff begins to fall away. And trying to explain this, look, I go to the Dominican Republic, try to explain Latinx to someone. Of course, I'm the idiot who does. Yeah, I'll be right. sitting there on the bus, Surrounded by folks on their way to these horrible jobs or on their way to some other burdensome, you know, uh, business. And I'm like, well, this is how you, this is why it works. And people are like, boo, <laughs> <laughs> gringo, shut up. I'm like, okay, I'm sorry. Um, all right, let's talk, let's talk writing. I asked one of my buddies what I should ask you, and I, cause he had read all your books as well, you know, thinking you'd have some like deep, you know, penetrating question about this is how you lose it or something. He's like, no, man, I just want to know, like, how, when does he write? How does he do it? Where does the inspiration come from? Is it a daily thing, like a lunch pail every day from 10 to noon, or just like when inspiration strikes and sometimes I go months without writing something? I, like, what's your, what's your process like? How do you go from blank page from zero to one? I used to be, and I'm starting to move back to it, I used to be the lunch pail writer. I think that yeah. ultimately, having spent over a decade trying to figure out some other way of doing this. I realized that for me, that's not working. Um, the waiting for inspiration to strikes isn't, isn't providing what I need. So the way I used to do it was, and I'm starting to do it again, was I would wake up in the morning, have my coffee, work. And by me waking up in the morning is always like quarter to six. By noon, I'm done. Call it a day. And that's what I'm getting back to now. What are you doing? Um, at, what are you doing at one o'clock, man? Having some... Having some churros or oh my God. What, what's one thirty look like if you're done by noon? If you're done well, by I, noon. I'm down my university responsibilities. <laughs> oh god. Okay, <laughs> got it. You have your day job, right? I mean uh, right now you're on break, you're in Tokyo, you know, so yeah. what you're having sushi or what what are you doing? Just hanging? Well, Should I still have I still have departmental responsibilities because uh, okay. even though I might not be teaching classes, we still have a bunch of stuff we have to do. So that takes up a little bit of time. Um and, you know, the, the weird thing about writing is it's sort of like being an athlete with like no money, no broken bones, um, no strange, uh, obsessive fans. There's a sense that the game is only a little bit of it. I spend the next I spend at least three or four hours a day reading because if you're not reading, you ain't going to do nothing. You know, it's, it's sort of like if you're in the if you're in the news biz and you ain't following the news. I mean, how are you going to get on and talk about it? So the the background work you do. So I read a lot, a lot, a lot. And what do you uh, read? Ideas, uh, I read a lot of history, a lot of politics, um, strangely, a lot of anthropology. Um, you know, I kind of just read as much as humanly possible. Um, Reisman's latest book uh, on Vince McMahon um, is... It's kind of how Vince McMahon yeah. and wrestling explain yeah. absolutely everything about yeah. Donald Trump and the, the whole moment. If you haven't read this book, yeah. it's J just our other podcast got uh, JVL, who's also on this podcast with us on Wednesdays, is, is like, we is like, maybe we should have Reisman on. I swear to God, just yesterday, he emailed me about this book. Reisman, Reisman is the real deal. Yeah. And, you know, uh, I know Reisman because his work in comics and uh, kind of the popular culture, but. This is someone who's got their got their finger on it and is looking for strange ways to explain the world. Because, look, 
If we're not explaining the world strangely, we're not going to get at how strange this world really is. And I know that seems like a, a simplistic, solipsistic statement, but we're in a real weird world, real weird world. And uh, wrestling helps to explain some of that. What, um, so you're doing high and low art reading, you know, you're reading some deep anthropological stuff. And also, you know, also you're reading about Stone Cold Steve Austin, you know, yeah, man. catching the and whole gamut. Know, you got to, you got to. <laughs> and I read a lot of fiction and, um, you know, uh, a lot of James C. Scott, you know, the man is like uh, weapons of the week um, and uh, things like that. And I got to tell you, I find myself finding books, for example, the little bars in Japan. Somebody left a copy of a, um, you know, one of these Herman Wolk. I can't pronounce his last name. One of these huge airport novel types book i'll read those or frederick forsyth you know stuff from the 80s yeah. i can i'll read anything because you never know what you can learn and how'd you how'd you decide to start reading you know i books came to me because i had such difficulty learning english i immigrated when i was six um speaking english was so difficult my accent people would back in those days the absolute to intolerance was just total uh, nobody can hear your accent when you're reading I became hyperlexic as a content, as a compensation for it. And then I had a friend who had immigrated, who'd come from Egypt, who had moved into the neighborhood, who was also a reader and his mother encouraged it. His mother worked for a publisher and she always would give me books. And if it wasn't for her, Mrs. Homaway, and for my librarian, Mrs. Crowell, I don't know where I would be because look, books are especially useful for one of the things I was saying earlier, as a method not only to learn, to get access to the world, to access to your emotions, to be able to deal with complicated, nuanced feelings, but also to reconstitute yourself. You have to have a habit of reconstitution. By the time the world gets done kicking with you, you need a space where you put yourself back together. And books were awesome. If it wasn't for them, I don't know how I would have survived my family. And not just because I could retreat, because they could just... In them, I reassembled myself. For somebody who keeps saying they're bad at language, you're using a lot of, you know, thousand dollar words. No, I'm Carapace, great. hegemony. English, English is where all of my, you know, I, I put all my energy into. Uh, but learning other languages, I've been a catastrophic failure. I lived in <laughs> Berlin. I lived in Holland. Yeah. I lived in Japan. And I never, never managed but a word or two. It's like the circuit burned out after English. Um, I want to ask you, I got one more book question after this, but I want to ask you about like the character development side of, of writing too. I just, so I, I, my, the only book I wrote was nonfiction and like the uh, writing fiction is so intimidating, right? Like it's hard for me to keep track of like what happened in real life, right? And what I'd wrote about in the book and not be repetitive and not, you know, and make sure that the reader knows what I know. Uh, in fiction, that just has to be like an unbelievable challenge, like, how, like like creating these characters. And you have the one character, Junior, who kind of goes through your different books, who who maybe has has some protagonist similarities to the author. But like all all of those other characters, like how do you keep track of them, their arcs and their story? And like, where does that emanate from? I think it just is part of that kind of you you lock into that process where you're there. And that's why get it. if you break from it, you kind of lose the magic. You're kind of creating this artificial world. And look, it, it only looks hard. I mean, it's hard. It's not easy, but it's, it's, it's a lot easier once you get the basics down. And it's kind of like, again, and not everyone's great at this. Some people are good at performing other roles. Um, and if you're good at performing other roles, if you've had to live in two or three different worlds, and so there's two or three different sides of you, you've had no problem sustaining them. And it's so much easier to anchor characters in these kind of different masks that you wear. And for me, uh, you'd be surprised how easy it is to forget the idea that we keep them in our minds at all the time. I, I guess I'm not that brilliant because I'll tell you what, after two days, if I don't go back and read what the hell I wrote, I will have forgotten very important things about Do so you have my like character. a beautiful mind board up there that's like Junior, he was he's this age and he, he started here. Like how how are you how are you doing that? Oh, process? I definitely have a cheat sheet. I have yeah. like for almost each of my characters, I will create a little index card of all the stuff that matters so I can look at it and at the center of it. Again, this always powers all of my characters. At the center of it, I write, what is the one thing this character will never say? And I, the writer, 
we'll never say for them. And that silence helps the character cohere because we all have something inside of us that's a deep, deep silence. And when we break that silence, we become someone else. Something that's and, true about them that they would never say? Is that what you're saying? Something that's true about them, something they experience, uh, something they're holding. Just a, what is the kind of the, the organizing silence of this person's life? And that's always helped me create characters. Um, I just want to ask you about Island Born, which is your kid's book everybody should buy. I'm, I'm holding it here. Um, we, uh, what, when we met at one of these ridiculous book festivals, uh, which I'll, I'll get to. I, I have a book festival, a funny book festival question for you in the rapid fire here in, in, in our final segment. But uh, Island Born is, is amazing. And why don't you actually, you explain the, the message of the book, then I have one question for you about it. I mean, for me, I just, I want it to work. I just work so slowly, but I had this kid's book idea um, because so many of my friends, whether they're Egyptian, um, whether uh, they're Khmer, like they have this experience where they've, they're like one or two generations removed from some horrific political monstrosity, whether it's some dictatorship, um, some just wild, you know, uh, nightmare, you know, national trauma. And I'm like, okay, given all this, why are there no kids book that talk about why maybe we immigrated, some of us immigrated, um, how do we explain to children, hey, we had this dictator that ate almost half our country up. And so I kind of wanted to create a book that would be, you know, that would work as a kid's book that wouldn't scare kids and it wouldn't be kind of like adult that would interest kids, but at least would uh, in some ways collaborate with what children already know. If you don't think a five or six or seven year old kid or doesn't on an unconscious level, isn't aware that there's a lot of shit behind the reason why their parents are the way they are, or why, you know, we immigrated. That's nonsense. Kids might not be able to understand it intellectually or put it to words, but they they know something's up. And so the book helps them to engage with it and collaborate in a safe way. So it's a book about a little girl who ends up writing a story about uh, her little community and ends up discovering that there is behind her little beautiful community. There's the, this, this dictator that chased everyone away. Yeah. Um, it doesn't scare kids. I've read it to Toulouse. And uh, I guess my old, it is beautiful. It is a beautiful book. My only critique is that it is, it's a little long for a bedtime book. I'm, ti long. I'm tired at the end of the day, baby. And I'm like, I'm not <laughs> page 22. You know, I'm like, come on. All right. I gotta, I gotta, I'm falling asleep here, but uh, it's, it was, it's good for a daytime book for your child. It's not as a no, bedtime man. book. I stop. So this is what happens when you don't have kids. But you, know, <laughs> you can imagine all sorts of generosity of pages. All right. Well, somebody who doesn't have kids, I'm going to ask you for parenting advice. This my, my takeaway from the book is this little girl, it, it's beautiful in a way, right? She, she left the island, which is called, which I assume is the stand-in for Dominican Republic, and she left the island, and, and she has this assignment, right, where she's, where she's asked to kind of draw it, right, and, and, and paint it and, and learn about it. And, and at the heart of that is this you know, like she has this little missing piece kind of, right? That I know I'm from here, but mm -hmm. but I, I haven't been there. I don't know it. And, you know, having an adopted daughter, you know, who's black, like I kind of, that that weighs on me a lot, right? And I'm just, you know, you, and so the immigrant experience isn't exactly the same as the adoption experience, et cetera. But there's, there's some parallels in the sense of like you having been a kid that like felt a little bit of a detachment from ancestors, from where you're from, just kind of wondering, like, if there are things that you wish you would have had more of as a kid growing up or if there are lessons from that experience. No, and it's interesting having uh, four other siblings, especially three that were one year apart. Four of us were one year apart. And you see the way different siblings under the same almost identical, similar conditions reacted very differently. And I think um, for me, when I think of my if I had had my four siblings as my kids, Someone like me who really wanted a connection with that island. Yeah. You know, my parents didn't respond to that. They were like, I really want to know. My parents were like, yeah, go back to the island so you could starve to death, which was very minatory, but very threatening. I was like, oh, God, you know, where they kind of were more in line with my other siblings who if you said, hey, let's go to the Dominican Republic, they'd be like, great, I get to go to the beach. Or my sibling who was like, I don't want to know anything about the Dominican Republic. I'm in America. And my parents endorsed that as well. 
And I think you got to, I mean, it sounds simplistic, but when I look at my siblings, I kind of wish my parent had met us each where we were at. I think right. I was more threatening only because I was inviting them to rethink where to think again about their own losses. You know, they gave up a lot more than I gave up when I left the island. They were full grown adults. And so having a kid who's like, oh, what's this about? What's that about? You're just like, you know what? I don't want to think about this place. Yeah. So meet a kid where they're at and try to size the loss appropriately. You know, I kind of don't think I would have been as obsessed with the Dominican Republic. My parents helped me size it and understand that like loss is a part of everything. I know it seems like a lot that you lose your country, but hmm, people leave, leave their neighborhoods all the time and you've got to size it appropriately. Unfortunately, yeah. no one was there to help me size it. So it became this overwhelming obsession for most of my life. Sarah, anything else before we get to the rapid fire and get let you know, get out to the streets of Tokyo? I mean, I could keep going all night, but let's 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 do the rapid fire. All right, rapid fire. This was one of them. Wasn't going to be my first, but since you just said it, for people who do want to go to the Dominican and maybe not just to the tourist beach, like do anything, any like, oh, you have to go see this or to this neighborhood or to this restaurant or anything like that. Yeah, I mean, Santo Domingo is so traffic like cursed. Um, I would say stay in La Condesa because at least you could do some walking. It's not La Condesa, it's like El Conde. I'm thinking about my time in Mexico City. My City. <laughs> stay in, in, in El Conde um, because at least you could do some walking. And look, before you get there, check to see what theater is playing. There's some really great theater in the Dominican Republic, like live theater. See that, you know. Uh, El Meson de Bari, get yourself some nice. I, I'm a, I love goat. So that's a restaurant well worth checking out. Um, I think it's called the Palacio del Falafel. Um, there's a falafel place there that I think is absolutely excellent. I wonder if they're still open if it's about the pandemic. Anyway, that's that. We'll Google it. Um, I, I want a colorful Spanish curse from you that I could use. Like, oh, uh, God. Really? Yeah, what's a favorite one? Ooh. Um, there's a couple of them. <laughs> Uh, oh my God! My my favorite my favorite from my own father was figurine de mierda, right? A little figurine of shit. I describe <laughs> you when you were acting up. I was like, wow, that is very very that is that it's is evocative. A it's evocative, yeah. And it's a finessed curse. I'm like, oh, figurine de mierda. Thanks, Dad. I won't forget that. Um. Let's see. What else do we have uh, here? A modern book or author that you admire that doesn't get enough love? I, you know, I, I'm always going to say uh, Samuel R. Delaney. I think it's like absolutely my favorite living author. Um, he's brilliant. If you have not read Times Square Red, Times Square Blue, this 90 page book explains uh, our kind of current lunacy better than anyone. Uh, he's just a genius. You're a man of the people, working class guy, class warrior, but I, I just have to I have to poke you. I want to know your favorite capitalist indulgence. You oh, know? absolutely. Eating and travel. Uh, the things that are putting the stake in the heart of the world, man. Well, I'm a person who, uh, you know, I, I definitely do weeks of research on where to eat. Um, and, and again, I just, I've, I travel to eat. This is what happens if you're not um, obsessively worrying about your kids. My friends travel, they're just like, their heads are blown off. I travel and I'm like, hey, listen, there's this hot dog place in Montreal I've been hearing about. You know, like, I want to go to Montreal and these, these young Asian American cats just opened up a, uh, a burger joint that I want to go to. This is what I live for. Yeah. Life is empty. That's cool, man. Start posting that on Instagram so I know where go. Okay, my last one, maybe you won't have it, but I, but I, I have to at least ask. These, th where we met was at this book. Uh, festival, I guess, in Palm Springs. These a lot of these things are like kind of ridiculous. I mean, you have there are these don't like these rich people are giving money and like you're a little bit like an animal in a zoo that you're like <laughs> speaking for them. So I'm just curious around all of this, you know, kind of elite crowd at book festivals and at these universities. Do you have a do you have a favorite, you know, kind of story or a little anecdote in your head, like ab absurdist absurdist experience that stands out? I mean, I'm again, I probably the one that had me both in stitches and just astounded was I was once asked to go to dinner with the then president of the Dominican Republic in the Dominican Republic with Nobel laureate Derek Walcott. 
And Derek Walcott and me sit down with uh, Leonette Fernandez. And Derek Walcott looks around and, you know, he's, again, I don't know Derek Walcott from pain. And Derek Walcott looks around and says, so, at the, you know, the kind of the presidential palace, he says, so, did y'all buy this with drug money? And I'm looking at him. <laughs> this is a Caribbean man. He was intentionally putting it to him. He knew what he was doing. You know, he knows what was up. But I never, I just was like, I have to go to the bathroom now. I have to go to the bathroom. For like a half hour, I was like, oh, That's good. This man, this man is out of control. Out of control. I love that. I got accidentally sat next to a t- Alan Dershowitz at the table at the thing that we were at. I didn't realize it was him until I sat down next to him. And so I, I kind of like your experience better. Give it, give it, give it to the Cadillo. Uh, give it to uh, the dictator, rather. Just a small one and a completely different side. I once sat next to, I was doing a photo shoot. Um, and, um, you know, I was doing a photo shoot and um I'm sitting next to a cat and I'm like, hey, uh, so and he's in the photo shoot, too. And he's like, um, you know, uh, I was like, so what do you do? And um, and he's like, oh, I live in California, blah, blah, blah. Now, you understand, I'm the biggest fan of Lord of the Rings that ever happened, that ever. I just love Lord of the Rings. Of course, it's Elijah Wood. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. You look so. And he said, yeah, I'm an actor. I'm like, you're an actor. That's awesome. And I walked away. <laughs> and all my friends, the people who were there were like. You didn't recognize him. How did you choke? He was just too short. He was shorter than you thought, or no, I just didn't recognize him. And I never think anyone famous is around. So <laughs> anyway, I, I missed my moment. I love him, and I love that. And I just, I'm still humiliated. My friends are still always like, the TV's on. They're like, look, it's Elijah Wood. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh. Um, dude, this was so good. Thank you for taking all this time. Um, okay. I'm so grateful. It was so nice to meet you. And um, I, I, I treasure your, your writing. I hope you have something else coming down the pike we can uh, that we can read and learn from. And uh, for all the folks listening, we'll be back on Wednesday with JVL for your normal next level uh, with the Bulwark. Catch you all later. Peace out. Bye. Thank you so much.